I was friendly with this girl who insisted on touching my face. She told outrageous stories. I believe them till the How to be a person, damn it, fuck. One, be addicted to Diet Coke. Two, eat breakfast. Three, have something called a throat chakra practice that a white woman teaches you about on YouTube. Four, wear communion socks with little frills at your ankles. They're four and eight year old, but they just about fit. They're almost sheer as they squeeze your foot. It reminds you of the Chinese foot binding stories you were told in primary school, but that is a really disgusting comparison to make, to compare your expensive dun store communion socks to that. The joy of your frilly socks is quickly replaced with disgust, so five, make a DIY earrings holder out of two masks and a shoebox lid. Six, arrange your wardrobe by colour. Seven, Hoover your carpet. Eight, so something, anything. Nine, set up a Depop account. Ten, nearly get scammed as a consequence. Eleven, go to your online tutorial at 9am. It's on race. You talk for ages with no video on, but nobody knows who you are. Nobody has to know that you're in bed. Wonder, is this the future that colorblind advocates want? Still, feel like shit in the tutorial. 12. Tell people you're busy on Tuesday. Tell people that you bullet journal. Tell people you're currently processing and digesting. You'll be at 100% battery soon. 15? Sit wide-legged on a low blue seat in the arts block of your university. Perch your feet on a wide, circular coffee table. Type fast and quickly and don't look at anyone when they pass you in the corridor. 16. Wear your new platform shoes. 17. Put plasters on your blisters. Hey Sam, it's Dan here. We must have missed each other again. Anyway, basically we had a read over your last few pieces and well, while we think the quality of the writing and the content itself is powerful, we still don't feel it's hitting the right tone for the review. We, in the office, feel like it's a... It's quite a dense and borderline difficult read at the moment. More of a manifesto than a think piece, really. I, I appreciate that that isn't what you were hoping to hear, especially I know things haven't been easy, you know, these past few weeks. But we have some revisions and some edits, and I would love to get on a call with you as soon as possible. These editorials, well, they need to be informative, but not too stern right now. And, and and look, Sam, I, I'm only telling you this because I know we're not just colleagues. We're friends, right, Sam? You're one of my best friends, and I know I'm one of yours. We We are friends, and I love you, and I want to publish you. So I say this with all the best intentions, but right now, Sam, we think that you're coming off a bit preachy. The board don't like it. On a personal note, though, however... I hope you're feeling okay. We really believe in your work and, and we are loving the Twitter content at the moment. We really want to get you and all your Saman stands on board. But we just feel that the tone of your additions need to read a bit more professional and balanced. So give me a buzz as soon as you listen to this and we'll work this out. All the best, Dan, Editor-in-Chief, The Review. Welcome to Oversight, a podcast that helps you check in with yourself and with wider society. We are taking a break from our scheduled spring cleaning saga to bring you a very special guest. I'm joined here today by Twitter sensation, Samantha Clark. 
and I am actually so excited for this episode. I am actually screaming internally right now. Say hi, Sam. Sorry, can I call you Sam? Um, yeah, sure. Hello. Samantha Clark started Just a Description in April of 2016, a blog for her to vent her personal observations and platform her social ideas. Her weekly blog, Why I'm Sad Today, skyrocketed her to fame in summer of 2020, and well, the rest is history, I guess, Sam. She made particularly notable claims in relation to class, gender, race, environmental and global economic justice. Samantha, welcome to the show. Um, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Wow, it's so weird to hear yourself talked about in the third person. Um, you've just listed this whole lot of topics. I wouldn't say that I'm in any way an expert. Don't in talk yourself down, Sam. Women are too quick to talk themselves down, to say, Oh, well, I'm not an expert in this or that. You care about these issues. You talk about them. Your contribution is valid. That's rule number one here on Oversight. Your contribution matters. Um, right. Well, okay. Happy to be here. And we're happy to have you. And how are you today, Sam? Good. Very good. It's 2pm and I have only just got out of bed, so I'm very thankful that there's no visual component to podcasts. I'm sure nobody wants to see me in my pyjamas and no, bed No, head. okay. I can see you on my Zoom screen here. And your pyjamas are very cute. Are those, um, are those polar bears on them? Everyone gets their favourite pyjamas at Christmas, right? Everyone wears Christmas pyjamas all year round. That's isn't just a me thing, is it? Well, I'm a bit of a pyjama fiend. I definitely have enough to last me the full year. Oh, it's it's not that I don't have enough to last me. It's no, no, I okay, I, I know. Um, it was an attempt at a joke. Right. <sighs> Shit. Sorry. Okay, don't worry. Um, we can edit that bit out. Right, yeah, of course. So, tell me about your rise to fame. Uh, I'm not sure that I would call it... I mean, see, when it's... Ugh, fuck. Normally, I'm so much better at this. Okay, um, hey, so, calm down. Don't worry. Let's take a breather. Are you nervous? You seem nervous to me. No, I'm... Not nervous. Look, I know we don't know, know each other, Samantha. We sort of Instagram know each other. But what's up? I want you to feel relaxed. <laughs> I can't remember the last time that I felt relaxed. Would you say this is due to your recent media attention? Or... Um... Are we still recording? We, we can edit that. Just I'd, I'd really rather we didn't talk about me personally. Right. Um, I, I am so sorry. I am totally crossing a line here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we can stick to your experts' topics. I'm really not an expert. It's just... Right. Fine. Yes. Let's just move on to something else. Right. Okay. Um, of course. So, I wanted to talk to you today about micro-level redistribution. I saw you posting about it the other day. Can you walk me and my audience through that? Yeah, of course. So, I know that I've been blogging about this a lot lately, but I need to get one thing totally clear. 
The idea isn't that I think macro-level wealth redistribution can be achieved through voluntary donation. A lot of people were calling me some sort of libertarian on Twitter. Classic Sam, the radical libertarian. <laughs> yeah, like, you'd have thought I suggested we privatise roads or hospitals or something like that. Yeah, like those um, ANCAP memes that are like, you get assaulted or something, so you call the nearest police, but your bronze level membership doesn't cover stabbings, and you can't get access to the private roads to drive to the um, MIG hospital. And yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, so basically, this is basically just noting the fact that, like, a lot of us personally feel like we receive undeserved income or wealth from whatever source. Like, a lot of us would prefer progressive benefit systems rather than flat level 250 euro for every student bullshit. And yet, we make genuinely so little effort to redistribute what we're able to. If the government is failing to properly redistribute wealth, that doesn't absolve you as an individual from redistributing what you can. So, put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Exactly. Hey, uh, my mom was wondering if you'd be able to pop around sometime this week. She wants you to help her pick something out for some event. And uh, I'm a bit useless. <laughs> you know she always wanted a daughter. Anyway. Uh, I hope you're well. I haven't heard from you in a bit. Okay, see ya. If you're reading this comment, I really love your blog. Was wondering if you're doing any tours or shows soon? I'd really, really love to meet you. I think you'd love my cat. I know that you're allergic, but she's hairless and her name is Sam too. Kisses. <laughs> Samantha Clark embodies a confused and unnecessary buildup of senseless political activists who form what is essentially a private army of left-wing operators who consider themselves the moral elite and moral activist class. Simply by coming into existence as what she terms woman of colour, though she seems about as pale as the author of this article, she claims a moral and elite high ground, actively disavowing free speech. She's no doubt funded simply as a byproduct of her own woke capital. She exists solely to harangue the state further down a specific path of liberalization. There is no need for people like her. There is a total oversubscription of such organizations. After following her account for weeks, I can comfortably conclude she is little more than a Frumpy activist trying to strong arm her way to an unwarranted political position through excessive use of guilt tactics. Well, readers, this is one privileged white man who isn't buying it. <laughs> so funny. Um, don't worry. Um, yeah. I want you to know that you mean everything to me. I wake up. And I am so pleased to see you on my timeline. I want you to know that. I need you to know that. Happy birthday! Jesus, you're 21. <laughs> I know turning 21 in lockdown must suck. But I hope these flowers brighten up your day. Call me back. <laughs> Call me back when you get this, okay? I love you and I miss you so much. All right. <laughs> I'll say it one more time. Just call me back. Okay, bye. Hey, Sam. Sorry to be calling out of the blue like this, but I just... Uh, I wanted to check in on you. I, uh... Well... You haven't been out with us in a while. And I know things have kind of blown up for you, but... Uh, just... I know you don't think I get you sometimes. But I absolutely do. 
We've been friends since we were 12, Sam, and I know you, and you know me, and maybe I'm not the smartest person ever, but sometimes you treat me like a... Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm not... That's not important right now. I, I didn't call to, to start a fight. Um, basically, uh, just I read that far-right incel journal's um, takedown of you. And look, I know we both know it was total bullshit, so I don't need to tell you that, but I just... I Fuck, I know it hurts you. Okay. And look, Sam, I'm not telling you... I'm not telling you your anger isn't justified. I'm just saying you need to process it um, better. <laughs> like, I don't think staying up all night and sending 400 tweets or whatever is good for you. You seem fucking tapped sometimes, Sam. You seem bitter and... I think, I think it could eat you. <laughs> Do you remember a few months ago, uh, we got stoned and watched some wildlife documentary. And in it, that snake unhinges its jaw and it eats a whole deer. And then David Attenborough says something like, like, this snake will not be able to move for a whole year, leaving it vulnerable to predators. And you said, that's me. <laughs> and I started laughing, but you kept, you kept shaking me and repeating, it's me. No, it's me. I ate the deer. I ate the whole deer. I ate the whole fucking deer. Like, really seriously. And I, I kept laughing. And um, every time you said it, I laughed harder and harder. <sighs> well... I'm, I'm sorry for laughing. And please don't take this the wrong way. Like, sometimes you take things the wrong way and absolutely shut people out. So, um, you need to listen to me. Sometimes, at least. Okay, call me back, please. <laughs> Sam, thank God, thank fuck, I'm so glad I got a hold of you. Oh, Dan, fuck, you called me on my home phone. I'm mm. actually just about to... Oh, uh, no, Sam, don't you dare blow me off. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's just I really have to deal with... Look, Sam, okay, fine, I get it. You have a process. Seriously, I, I understand. I, I know it can be hard to transition to a more refined type of writing. I, I know it's hard to restrain yourself. Not, not that I mean you can't control yourself, I'm just saying it, it's easy to let your passion override you. Don't worry, I, I'm, I'm gonna help you out. People like you, Sam, they, they trust you, they trust your view on things. So, I put a call out on the website homepage and I'm sending some agony and dilemmas over to you now. Wait, what? Yeah, there's, there's no way I can do that. It it's nothing like my style, and I'm Sam, absolutely Sam, people love to listening to you. They they want your perspective on things. They they want to apply some of that knowledge to their own real life situations. You are empathetic. You're smart. You're clever, and hell, I believe in you. Yeah. Okay. It's not that I don't believe in myself. So get it to me by Monday. I need words on a page if this partnership is going to work out. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Hey Sam, uh, I read that article you wrote, um, I do read your blog, you know, uh, the one about being proactive in your friendships or whatever, about uh, like choosing your life and your circles, um, well, I didn't like it, I don't think that it's a bad thing that we're friends from circumstance. Like, I know it wasn't about me or anything, but, like, I know we didn't ask to live on the same street or, like, be in the same classes and we didn't, we didn't choose to be friends. And I know I didn't, I, I don't do much, like, upkeep or whatever. Um, but it's not a bad thing to be from somewhere. 
you know, it's not a bad thing to love some of your accidental circumstances. I know that's not what you were saying, but, like, I don't see what's special about your university friends either, Sam. Like, surely it's all just random. This is actually my first time writing one of these things. I saw the call out for Modern Dilemmas on the review's homepage yesterday and I thought, oh, fuck it. So here goes. I've been going out with my current boyfriend for just about six months. We met during Freshers Week of College and instantly hit it off. I went to an all-girls school before, so I didn't really know that many guys. Well, it's not like I knew none, but like, you know, none very well. I had friends and I went to discos and stuff, but this is my first time really liking a guy and my first time really being with someone like this. I'm 19, which makes this kind of embarrassing, but I don't think it's that uncommon. Anyway, basically, the gist is that I'm not super experienced in this department. So, yeah, so we've been dating for six months and early on in our relationship, he saw I retweeted this blogger's post. He didn't, like, freak out. But he basically went on and on about how she and him used to go out and that she totally fucked him over by leading him on or whatever. And he can't get over it. He says he finds her quasi-fame really upsetting and it makes it hard for him to forget about their tumultuous relationship. He insisted I unfollow her on everything, but he still follows her and has his phone set to notifications. Like, I try not to worry about him being hung up on her. I figured people grieve and deal with things in their own way, right? Google search Samantha Clark photos. But that isn't the weird part. I've noticed he follows a few of the far-right journals operating out of our university. I know he's got some conservative beliefs, but he's never done anything to alarm me. But recently, these journals have started posting large amounts of slanderous articles about this blogger. I know... I know this I know this makes me sound crazy. And I'm probably thinking too much about it. But I feel like I I feel like it's written in his voice. Google search Samantha Clark nudes. Oh, I but that is still not the weird part. I asked him a little while ago how he knew her. And he says they were in a transition year course thing together. But she's two years older than us. And I know from her blog that she didn't do transition year. So I've mentioned her in passing to one or two of his friends and they've never heard of her. I I've lightly pressed him for details on how they met, how long they dated for or what happened. And he reacts defensively. And often with incoherent or conflicting statements, like the age they were when they dated, the, the length of their relationship and what age they were when they met, very drastically. I'm starting to doubt whether they ever knew each other at all. Oh, just, oh, why, why is he obsessed with this girl? It is really hard to deal with unhappiness when it doesn't amount to anything. I think we, all of us, or maybe just me, have a tendency to chalk up traumatic experiences into parables, to contort them into life lessons, or weave them into some sort of narrative. When you write a character, it's easy, or in fact, often desirable, to attribute their actions to some sort of backstory. It's almost <laughs> deterministic, in a way. You take your unhappiness and you turn it into positive character traits. You're stronger, you're wise, or you're brave. Or it can justify your current unhappiness. 
or your outbursts, problems or vulnerability. But sometimes you look back on experiences and you think, what the hell did that mean? Why can't I evaluate it? Why can't I learn from it? What the hell is wrong with me? In school, I had this really good friend, Naomi. I think when you're, you know, a young teenager, your best friend is seriously everything to you. She didn't go to my school for a ton of reasons, but I saw her every Sunday. And we had the same sense of humour, and anyone she met really, really loved her. So I could introduce her to anyone. She was really strong (laughs) physically, like she had large biceps, and she was really good at plaiting her hair. I don't know why I'm using the past tense. She's not dead. Anyway, I just feel like we complemented each other really well. Like, we fought, of course. I mean, I was pretty self-absorbed and on the dramatic side. I mean, I was like 15. Naomi thought that everything was a big deal to me and she'd say these things like, do you have to? And things like, why are you so... But then she'd assure me that she loved these qualities in me, really. I don't know if she had a point or not. It's it's hard to remember these events in any specific detail and not just look back on all my teenage years as a sort of loud, angry demeanour. But we spent a lot of time together, like whole weeks and summers almost. I hadn't really ever had anything like that where I felt heard. And I did feel heard most of the time. I thought I heard her most of the time, but I don't know. She started ignoring me, not texting back, not showing up to things I invited her to, and then out of nowhere, after a lot of double, triple, quadruple texts, she sent me this message, and it was so upsetting, and and I think maybe it was the first time I found myself looking at my hands as meat covered in lumps rather than devices that I controlled. I remember trying to text back and looking at my screen and my fingers and my nails and wondering, like, what what am I looking at? She'd said, hey, I've been really struggling to write this for a while, but I need to say something. Our friendship isn't good for me. I think you need to work on yourself and sort yourself out, and I want to grow too. You treat other people badly, especially the people you're close to. And I feel like I barely know who you are anymore. I never know what's going on with you, and to be honest, I'm sick of it. I can't handle it. I don't want to be a part of it anymore. You lie, and you hurt me, and you make me feel second best to your other friends. And I can't stress enough that I'm looking at my hands and I'm thinking, who am I? What am I looking at? What have I done? I don't know how my fingers are moving. I don't know how my skin is hitting the screen, but I'm praying that Naomi is still looking at her screen somewhere else, because I keep texting her. I text her, Okay, I can respect that. It's okay, but what have I done? Can I have an example? And I'm thinking, how can I fix it if I don't know what I'm really doing and what's wrong with me? She texts back that the very fact I'm asking for examples and explanations is the perfect example of why I need to evaluate myself and how I treat other people. It's confirmation to her that it's the right choice for her to make. I text, no, of course, I get where this is coming from even though I don't, not really. She texts back, well, if you knew why it was coming, why didn't you ask me, like really ask me? I I don't know what to say. I start fumbling out some words, but she doesn't reply. I'm not saying that I'm in the right. I'm not saying that at all. I I don't want to make anyone feel like that, but I can't be sure that I won't. I just... I'm not sure what to make of it, of any of it. She doesn't owe me an explanation. She really doesn't. She is not a tool for my own self-improvement project. And I don't want her to be. This blog is just a description. When I think back on it all, I feel empty. Sam, you haven't always been easy to be friends with, you know that? 
And I know maybe I'm not easy to be friends with either. Uh, I'm just feeling a little bit betrayed lately. You know, I've always been your friend. Always. And I know you think it's because I'm simple or uncritical or passive. But, but maybe it's because I love you, Sam. Maybe when you were such a massive bitch in school and nobody wanted to be your friend anymore. Not even Naomi. Maybe I was still your friend because I loved you. Maybe I wasn't just indifferent. Ever think about that? I've sent over a couple more agony ant letters, Sam. Can you please take a look at them? I, I looked through them personally to find some unusual ones. Ones I think fit your vibe. Uh, call me back. Sam. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to try that again. Sam. I'm not real. Please send help. <laughs> what I mean is... I'm writing to you because I'm worried I'm not real. I was previously very worried and panicked about it, but writing this I'm uncharacteristically calm, which I hope will serve me in my effort to articulate this problem I'm facing. I'm not crazy, but there is no force inside me. Nothing emanates. I'm not depressed, not even unhappy really. Not unwell or unfulfilled. But I'm so sure that I'm pretending to be a certain type of person. Like the person who does yoga, the person who walks, who rises early, the person who cares, who speaks, who oh, has a shoe rack. <laughs> I'm a person with a shoe rack, not a person open bracket with a shoe rack close bracket, you know? Nothing can free me from this thought. Any effort to discover myself leaves me feeling more like a hollow figure attempting to reenact a shallow Julia Roberts film. Every activity and breath I take, no matter how private, is never for me. It's to prove to myself and all past iterations of myself that I am a certain kind of person. But normally that's something too abstract to even really explain. I think, I think I'm trying to be a large, somewhat jagged, somewhat smooth, concrete slab. See, sometimes when I feel self-deprecating, I'm tempted to say, like, you are disgusting. You are the smell of hot tarmac. You are wet concrete stuck to sandals. You are lewd comments etched on pathways. But in reality, I don't even feel like that. I'm... I'm a whisper. I'm like... All the footsteps that almost stood in a particular patch of concrete, but for whatever reason, did not. I've no idea how to shake this feeling. I mean, I doubt you will know either. But... I have to know. Do you feel it too? Thank you.